People deserve to know the whole story. I came back from the dead. I felt like I owed humanity something. I wanted to bring gay marriage to Utah. It was the norm. Gay marriage is never going to come to Utah. General attitude was is the Mormon church is never going to allow this in Utah. Well, let's not go to the Mormon church with this. We have the federal laws and we have the Constitution. They were afraid to stand up to the big giant. out there that think that this is a losing cause, the immortal Don Quixote showed us the result. I think we should go down and see if we can catch him. Mr. Brown. Hi. Hi, good. I just wanted to introduce myself and welcome you to Utah. Okay, I'm Mark good. Lawrence. Hi. I'm the director Mark, of Brown. I'm the director of Restore Humanity. Oh, very good. I'm the one that brought the lawsuit that brought down Amendment 3. We're just saying that marriage is not only about a man and a woman. Yeah. Marriage can be expanded to include everybody. Yeah. Every loving couple yeah. who is together why not in a committed four, five relationship. Or six, then? That's not my argument. But why not? I don't care. It has nothing You're, to do with Well, I do life. care. I do care because Why? the binary structure of marriage is in the best interest of children and society. It's important that children are connected with their mothers and fathers. Yeah, but children and don't have do, anything to do with this. They, this has nothing they, to do with children. They have everything. Gay, people, gay is, people have kids because they want kids, marriage, not because they're married. If marriage has a meaning mm -hmm. and you take that meaning and you basically say it applies to everything, by expanding it in the way that you're claiming, you no longer have any central meaning for it anymore. No, 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 no. no. We just, again, we can agree we, to we disagree. Agree. Thank you thank for hey, approaching me. Thank you very yeah. much. I have been looking forward to meeting you for yeah. a long time. Very good to meet you. Good luck. Good. Thank good you, good sir. Good. Appreciate it. <laughs> that is a lifelong ambition, and I finally met it. I'm ready to die now. <laughs>
My parents pretty much live at the poverty level. And I just made a decision one day that I should probably just move in with them for a while. But that was before my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So it just got to a point where I couldn't leave and I'm still here. Well, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that I, you've been doing, I, I and I are. don't know how you stay on top of it. And help with your dad. Um, I wouldn't have anything else to do. <laughs> oh, sure. I, I know you are, but I have a place to go and, and vent, so it's only I can come home and hide down in the basement, and I'm okay. Well, your dad supports you, too. I know. Uh, it was a big shock to both of us in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you came out of the closet, yeah. but I do not understand how parents can kick a child out of their home when they find out that they're homosexual or mm -hmm. uh, anyway, it, it, it's just unbelievable. I grew up in a farm community in Utah. All my friends that I associated with well, were all, of course, in the Mormon church. You could make one statement or have one thought and a friend would say, hey, you can't think like that. Don't do that. You'll go to hell. You know, you're going to make God mad at you. Crazy stuff. My best friend. All the guys would go over to his house to look at his dad's Playboy. Well, I wasn't interested in them. So my job was to stand out front and watch for his mom to come on <laughs> and ring the doorbell. I wasn't interested, and that's what I knew. I moved to San Francisco in the early 80s when AIDS was at its peak. The response I was getting from people here, why are you going there? You'll get AIDS. I never had any real relationships there. I was willing to be risky about going out, going to bars and trying to pick up tricks and meet strangers and, and that kind of stuff. That was okay, that, was that, that kind of risky behavior is fine because that's part of being gay. And it was a lot easier to try to pick up a trick and, and not have to become emotionally involved or connected to anybody. It was also part of fighting AIDS. You know, screw AIDS, I'm gonna go out and have sex whether you like it or not. And, and it was part of the militant thing that we all went through. For some stupid reason, I thought, I ought to go get tested. <laughs> see what my HIV status is, and I did, and, uh, and I, I was positive, and I did not expect that, I did not know that. Watched people die in San Francisco, I watched ACT UP, I watched, I just stood off the sidelines though. I didn't do anything, I just watched. I would look at that and go, why can't I do that? Why am I not out there marching with them? Those people have got a lot of guts and they have a lot of courage, and maybe I was afraid. It would have given me a hell of a lot more meaning if I had known I could be down there marching with those people and, and sticking with them instead of reading about it in the paper. Utah's political landscape is somewhat unique in that one denomination dominates the culture. Mm -hmm. Based on what you have seen and experienced, is Utah a democracy or a theocracy? Oh, clearly a democracy. We're nowhere close to being a theocracy. But I do have issues with how the Mormon church lobbies the legislature. All of Republican leadership, almost all are members of the Mormon church, and they are able to whisper into the ears of a few members of Republican leadership, and then bills magically go through without objection, or they magically die, and there's not a lot of talk about it. Really, to appreciate the significance of overturning a same-sex marriage ban in the state of Utah, you have to understand that Mormon history, doctrine, and culture permeate every aspect of public policy and public opinion. 
One way we can see that is in the twice yearly conferences that the church holds in Salt Lake City. Those draw tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints who come to hear words of wisdom and direction from their church leaders. We believe that the organization and government of heaven will be built around families and extended families. It is because of our belief that marriage and families are eternal that we as a church want to be leaders and participate in worldwide movements that strengthen them. We want to help these people, to strengthen them, to assist them with their problems, and to help them with their difficulties. But we cannot stand idle if they indulge in immoral activity, if they try to uphold and defend and live in a so-called same-sex marriage situation. We also need politicians, policymakers, and officials to increase their attention to what is best for children in contrast to the selfish interests of voters and vocal advocates of adult interests. Mormonism is very different from Protestantism, and part of that does have to do with the role of leaders. What makes a difference is the way that leaders are oracles, leaders are the voice of God or the divine. It's tough to understand the church's motivations unless you've been Mormon or maybe Scientologist, one of these all-consuming, all-in religions. There is no part of the country where 70% or 67% of the population belongs to a single faith. So the church is a big employer. It also owns property. It may be the largest single landowner in the area. Everybody here talks about religion all the time, and that means they talk about the church, and there's no doubt about which church it is. Nothing's about to happen at the Capitol that the church doesn't 100% endorse. It absolutely will get its way on LGBT issues, on marriage issues. Equal rights! From a PR perspective, it's been a tough couple of years for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Recently, there have been angry protests outside Mormon temples over the church's support of Proposition 8. Yours is a church that has experienced extraordinary persecution and discrimination. Uh, right. Children killed, homes burned, women raped, entire populations pushed uh, across the Great Plains. Why would you want to tell another group of people what they can't do by law? We were for marriage between a man and a woman. The gays and lesbians are saying, look, we, we too are a persecuted group. We too deserve our rights under the law. But, but what I'm saying, this isn't, this, this, this isn't because it's directed at, uh, at another group. It's for the protection of a 5,000 year history of marriage being between a man and a woman. One of the doctrines which is unique in Mormonism is that marriage is for eternity. That is one of the most satisfying and we think beautiful doctrines before you even have a sense of your identity or your attraction, you are taught, find a mate and have a family. That is what God wants. If I'm gay and I'm not going to get married, then I'm a threat to the eternal family. Not only for me, but my parents think I'm not going to be part of their eternal family. Inside sacred buildings called temples, couples can be married not just until death do you part, but for eternity so families can be together forever, even after death. Who made this possible? God did. Why? God isn't just our Creator. He's our Father. We are His children, His family. That's the big picture, and we're all a part of it. It was around 2010, I was diagnosed with cancer, with lung cancer. I went into chemotherapy and just took a couple of years off of my life. And I came out of it different. Felt like, you know, I've got this second chance now. Let's do something. I have a pile of regrets like this. <laughs> and some of the things that I would wish I had done, I didn't. So the lawsuit actually started from a discussion group on Facebook. I said, I am putting together a federal lawsuit to overturn Utah's ban on gay marriage. And then we started meeting in coffee shops and started talking about it. I contacted Mark 
uh, on the comment board and said, I'm interested, when and where. We thought it was crazy and there was no way in hell it would happen, except we were going to try. None of us had PR experience. None of us had experience in legislation, in fundraising, certainly. We just had will. And I started contacting community leaders saying, well, you know, let's do this. And they, they couldn't get on board with it. And that really, really pissed me off. I went to the ACLU and they said, you can't possibly be serious. It was almost like he was going door to door trying to find someone. I think I sent out a, a whole bunch of emails one day. And Magleby and Green, went, uh, Jim Magleby responded. Friday, February 8th, 2013, 3.55 p.m. from Mark Lawrence. I represent an organization that is working to challenge Utah's Amendment 3 in federal court. We are now seeking a legal team. Is this something that you would be interested in? And we responded, Mr. Lawrence, I would be very interested in our firm representing your group, but could not work pro bono. If you would like to meet with me and my partner, Peggy Tomczyk, please let us know. That was the beginning. I really had respect for him for being someone who was not involved in any organization nationally or locally that had any power and had just decided on his own he was going to do this. And I thought, you know what, that takes a lot of chutzpah. And he said, I'm looking for lawyers who can handle a really nasty fight with the state of Utah. And then Jim, because he owns the firm and it's an economic decision, ask the right questions, who's going to pay for this? You'd never guess it by looking at him, but he is an eternal optimist. And he said, we'll get the gay community in Utah. We'll even get donations nationwide because we're going to do this. Oh, don't worry. I can raise, because we estimated it'd be around a million dollars to do this. He said, oh, I can raise this. There is no issue, blah, blah, blah. And I am thinking in my mind, this guy has no connections with anybody on earth. There is no way this guy's going to raise any money. And I think, do I care? I think, no, I don't care because it's the right thing to do. So I go, yeah, I think we, yeah, I, I'm sure that that can happen. So we decided to take it on. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Marceline, oh, happy birthday to you and many more. Here's your seat. So you're 13. Yay! I didn't really come out to my parents. Someone outed me to my mother and she called me told me I was not allowed to bring any girlfriends home, and I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that because you aren't gonna be seeing me. It was really a very dangerous time for lesbians and gay men. You got beat up, you got your car windows broken out. Joe Redburn, who owned The Sun, hired security to walk people from the bar to your car, but still people would go by and grab people off the street. I met her at a dinner at her house. We were out on the patio and a baby bird flew out of the tree and landed on my shoulder and started eating food off my plate. And she came over and we played with this baby bird and fed it and just started talking to each other. In all candor, I was an asshole at that point in my life. I was making a lot of money. I had no obligations. Um, and I drove a 911 Porsche Cabriolet, and I thought it was the coolest thing walking. But I was dispelled of it very quickly after I met Cindy. I had to work on a project over the weekend, and I had asked the senior lawyer secretary to come in. She is Marcelino's grandmother. I had never met him. He just turned three years old. And I got out these little books. And I read him to him and he was just laughing. About two weeks later, he came in with his mother, been kind of beat up, and he saw me in the hall and he grabbed me and said, please take me home with you. One day in the middle of the day, I got a call from Marcelino's great-grandmother. She said, Peggy, I am too old to be raising this child. Can he come live with you? And we said, of course. 
like with all my cases, I believe in my clients and I want to win. But in this particular case, it's very personal to me because if I could accomplish this, I could ask Cindy to marry me and I'd be able to adopt Marcelino. Only Cindy had been able to adopt him. I've been his mom since he first asked me to take him home. If something happens to Cindy, I would have no rights, none. So I personally believe in this to the bottom of my heart. Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph, thy sins are forgiven thee. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. At a future time, the complete truth of the gospel will be revealed to you. After this vision, Joseph Smith found the Mormon church in an upstate New York farming community in 1830. And by all accounts, he is charismatic and he quickly develops a small but loyal following. What he sees is that his church and the church that he believed that Jesus Christ founded is one and the same and it had been lost. But not only that, he even saw Jesus' project in some ways as not really fulfilled. And what he was doing was bringing back together all of the things that had been lost. And that included polygamy as a restoration of an ancient practice that had been lost and that was a key feature of what the heavens looked like. This becomes a very secret practice by Smith and some high-ranking men in the church. Whispers about plural marriage and in some cases underage brides begins to leak out into the society and this becomes a boiling point for Smith. As the rumors started to spread, he was framed as sex crazed rather than being seen in the light that he wanted to see himself as a prophet restoring a divine institution. So as the church grows, so does the discomfort that outsiders are having with Mormon teachings. There were conflicts between these different communities. And Governor Boggs of Missouri declared an extermination order on Mormons. They appealed to the federal government for help, who was not willing to rescue them. Joseph Smith was taken to a jail. A mob assembled outside. They overpowered those who were inside and killed Joseph and his brother. This forces them to move west, hoping they can find a place where they will be outside the reach of government. They end up in the Utah Territory, which is just outside the boundaries of the United States. Zion, they would call it, where they can have the church be the center of their life. It's a theocracy, not a democracy. They were defenders of religious freedom, and they lost this battle against the federal government. They took it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you do not have the religious freedom to practice your religion as you believe it. The federal government is not going to allow Utah to join the Union if they insist on keeping religion at the center of public life and practicing polygamy. Mormons decided they could no longer sustain their practices of polygamy without 
endless conflict with the federal government. It finally came time to make this decision about statehood and polygamy as deeply ingrained as it was in Mormon culture was worth sacrificing to gain statehood. That moment had a powerful impact for future generations of Mormons who believed that they could at any time be persecuted to such a degree that they would have to flee and fear for their lives. There is a huge persecution complex. You could say it comes from the government forcing the church to change practices on polygamy. But I think it comes down to a doctrine of good and evil, that the more the church is being persecuted and criticized, well, the truer it is. You've tried all of our products before, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I thought so, but... And our last one, Tomb, is a garlic spread. A tablespoon is about five cloves. And we use this the same way a condiment is used on a burger or a sandwich. Having fun? Yeah. I was at a meeting, and that's where I met Derek and Moody. And I said, I am putting together a federal lawsuit to overturn Utah's ban on gay marriage. We need some plaintiffs. And at first, they didn't even take me seriously. Moody's response was, no, I don't think we can do something like that. It was this man who was really determined, and it, it was almost off-putting to me at first. And I said, why don't you think about it? Just give it some thought. <laughs> Utah? Yeah, right. Good, good luck with that. And so I I started following up with them. I would talk to them a little bit more. And even though I wanted to be married, I didn't take him seriously or the idea of bringing marriage equality seriously to Utah. About three months after we met him the first time, he gave me a call and he said, I have a couple of attorneys. Would you and Moody like to meet? It legitimized the concept to me in a way that he was never capable of doing. Because it is then that I felt comfortable, actually, and I felt as if I, I would have two people that understand what they're doing. And we realized that this would become a case centered on on us and our story, and it really relied on our own desire to marry. And I have to say this, but it wasn't Mark that was involved. It wasn't a story about Mark, which is not a story I was willing to buy into originally. There was not this kink in the chain, if you will. I just thought they were perfect because they'd been together for a couple of years. They owned a business together, and they had so much at stake. And I just liked them. I thought they were great guys. Uh, they were pretty, you put them out there in the press. Uh, they were both very, very smart, very well spoken. We came to the conclusion that it was the right thing to do and we were the right people to do it. And if it's not gonna be us, then who else would, would do it? And they came back and we talked and they both said, you know what, we'll take the consequences. And then Derek said, I want my name to be the name. I think I signed on as the bride at that time. <laughs> We're just English teacher geeks. We're sometimes we're little old ladies. My dear friend, we were sitting and talking about our day and she said, Oh, do you and Lori, would you consider like joining a case and suing the state to overturn Amendment 3? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'll, I'll check with Lori on that. Yes, we have to do this. I think this is great. I'm glad someone thought of it. Let's be a part of it. We wanted another couple, and Cody and Lori came in and talked to us, and I just went, wow, this is it. This is our group. I think I always wanted to make a difference, but I used to joke that I liked living in Utah because I could be a radical and not leave the sofa. And she walked me to work that Monday and texted me and <laughs> said, do you want to be the bride or the groom? 
They said the bride, of course. <laughs> There was a major transition that happens after World War II. Mormons start to think about same-sex sexual acts as a psychological condition. A new kind of person is emerging. Homosexuality is in fact a mental illness which has reached epidemiological proportions. The minister quoted is reported to have said two people of the same sex can express love and deepen that love by sexual intercourse. Those are ugly voices. They're loud and raspy. To the great Moses, these perversions were an abomination and a defilement, worthy of death. The idea that someone is gay is an idea that Elder Kimball strongly rejected. He believed that homosexuals who were telling the story were perpetuating a satanic lie. And he's trying to teach people to train their minds through a set of practices like singing hymns, exercising. So his program of self-mastery is the cure to same-sex desires. Masturbation, or rather common indiscretion, is not approved of the Lord, nor of his church. That's like playing in the rapids. When you're in the whitewater, things can happen fast. Masturbation is the introduction to the more serious sins of exhibitionism and the gross sin of homosexuality. I hope fervently that I am making clear the position of the Lord and His Church on these unmentionable practices. So He set me on my journey down the river There is a falsehood that some are born with an attraction to their own kind and that they can do nothing about it. They are just that way. And that is, that is a malicious, destructive lie. Elder Boyd K. Packer, one of the highest ranking leaders of the church, really takes on the mantle of Kimball in combating homosexuality. Now there are some men who entice young men to join them in these immoral acts. If you are ever approached to participate in anything like that, that is the time to vigorously resist. There's this interesting moment when Elder Packer, in his speech, praises a missionary for assaulting his companion when his companion made a sexual advance. My response was, well, thanks. Somebody had to do it, and it wouldn't... <laughs> And it wouldn't be well for a general authority to solve a problem in that way. <laughs> now, I'm not recommending that course to you, my young friends, but I'm not omitting it. You must... <laughs> you must protect yourselves. We've witnessed a rapid and increasing public acceptance of cohabitation without marriage and same-sex marriage. The corresponding media advocacy, education, and even occupational requirements pose difficult challenges for Latter-day Saints. Within a year of when Dalinox became a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he wrote a lengthy memo reflective of his own background as a justice in the Utah Supreme Court. It became a playbook for how the church should and in fact did proceed to defend its position against what he saw as a possibility eventually of same-sex marriage coming to the forefront of the gay rights movement. He says there's a potential for the normalization of homosexuality that becomes so severe that the church must speak up. In 1990, three same-sex couples put Hawaii's tolerance to the test when they applied for marriage licenses. We grew up realizing that marriage is the next progression after you find somebody and fall in love with them. That's the next thing you do is get married. 
I wanted to marry Ninia early on in our relationship. It's unfortunate that, you know, gay people can't do that. They can't just run away and elope. The lawsuit in Hawaii represented the church's entry formally into the political arena on the subject of same-sex marriage. A male and a female walk in and they're not married, they want a license, you give it to them. A male and a male walk in, want a license, you won't give it to them. You are discriminating against them. And this is where the shock wave began that swept across the Pacific Ocean and flooded the mainland from coast to coast. This sets off alarm bells in Salt Lake City. And the church goes into full response mode. It starts to organize politically, it starts to organize its teachings, and there's a real push for thinking about heterosexuality and the family and a new kind of mobilization of anti-gay politics during this time period. In the context of all of this, it issues a political document called the family, a proclamation to the world. And this document appeals to members of the church, but it also appeals to judges and legislatures. I now take the opportunity of reading to you this proclamation. And it became central to Mormon identity really quickly. Missionaries began to hand out copies of the proclamation on the family saying, this is what we believe. Members of the church began to frame copies of it and hang it on their wall. It's really impossible to overestimate the importance of this document in Mormon teaching. We solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. This document doesn't mention homosexuality at all, which is in part the genius. We further declare that God has commanded that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between man and woman lawfully wedded as husband and wife. We call upon responsible citizens and officers of government everywhere to promote those measures designed to maintain and strengthen the family as the fundamental unit of society. The conflict between Mormons and gay rights activists, both within and outside of the church, becomes the defining issue of modern Mormonism. And so it's in this climate that we see the predominantly Mormon Utah legislature pass laws that ban gay marriage, refuse to recognize same-sex unions that are legal in other states, and that then leads us to Amendment 3. Tonight, same-sex marriage in Utah is taking center stage. Three couples are challenging the ban, saying it's unconstitutional. Having the ability to walk into a federal courtroom in Salt Lake City, Utah, with a real federal judge sitting behind the bench and being able to argue why the Constitution did not permit a failure to recognize gays and lesbians as equal citizens was something I never dreamed I'd see in a courtroom in my life, let alone me being the one that got to do it. Peggy is standing there and Judge Shelby asked her a question to the effect of, if I rule on this, will I be the first court to address these issues? And Peggy, without missing a beat, says, yes, congratulations. And the courtroom erupts into laughter. I sat there and watched Peggy for like an hour and a half engaging with Judge Shelby. He didn't take his eyes off her, and it was amazing. That's when I realized what kind of an attorney she was. She was an amazing woman. It was brilliant. I just, wow. I was in awe. And then we got to watch the, uh, uh, the guys from the attorney general's office make asses out of themselves for 45 minutes. They tried really, really hard to make this argument without bringing in God and religion into it, because they knew they couldn't in a United States court but it's the culture of the state. The state's hired LDS people and they try to make a secular argument out of it, but it's not possible for them to do. Judge Shelby, and this I think was kind of him, said he would let us know by January 7th. So that's why when December 20th happened, nobody expected it.
for you folks who are just tuning in. Amendment 3 of Utah's Constitution has been declared unconstitutional. So right now, marriage licenses are being handed out to same-sex couples. Some marriages are actually being performed in Salt Lake. I was at work. I think about 2 o'clock in the afternoon we get an email from Peggy and just said we won. To file a case in March and have a decision by December 20th of the same year, it's never happened in my 31 years of practice. We received a phone call that said, did you hear the news? And they were like, no, what's the news? They said, you won. I got in my car. I drove to send, I texted her. I said, we won, we won, we won. Will you marry me? I'm on my way to your office to pick you up to get married. She goes, we won what? And I go, we won our case. We can get married. And she goes, of course I'll marry you. So I drive to her office and I text, I go, I'm here, I'm here, come out, let's go. She texts me back, I'm a doctor. I'm with patients. I cannot leave. I go, have them come, they can be our witnesses. It is an enormous day for Utah, and not only for same-sex couples, but it brings equality to the entire state. Our case was very strong. Our law firm, our legal team was brilliant. They were passionate, and we told the truth. Now pronounce you wife and wife. I'm joined now by a couple who just got married like 15 seconds ago. You have been together several years now. What does this mean for you? It means that we're legally married in the eyes of the state. It does. It, it means everything to us. Laurie and I looked at each other and we said, "Let's, let's do this." And so we did. And it was. Um, it was unexpected. Then once, once I looked into her eyes. And I said, I do, and I got to be her wife. And then I really, really got it. It was as sacred as anything. And to have the entire courtyard erupt in cheers was just fantastic. Of all the pictures that I've ever seen of me, I love that picture because I've never seen me happier. We kept asking ourselves after the hearing, when are they going to file the motion to stay the ruling? We expect it's coming. They've got some time. We know the judge isn't going to rule right away, but there's a chance they might lose. And when the decision came down, there was no stay. Now, at the time, the Utah Attorney General's office was a train wreck. He had never bothered filing a stay, which is normal procedure in a court proceeding. I guess he couldn't even possibly imagine they were going to lose this case. So I drive back to the office and go in and Judge Shelby's office calls and said, Judge Shelby uh, wants to get you and the state lawyer on the line. What's your question? He goes, well, we don't understand your decision. What do you mean you don't understand my decision? Well, there's nothing in there saying you're staying your decision and we understand people are getting married. And I said, I understand that too, Your Honor. He said, you didn't file a motion to ask me to stay my decision. You tell me when you will file your motion for a stay and I'll immediately hold a hearing. And the lawyer for the state goes, I don't know what we're gonna do. And Judge Shelby goes, well, I guess there's nothing I can do for you then. Good day. What the state of Utah was asking Judge Shelby to do was rule on a motion that they had never filed. If there had been a national right-wing organization in the case that litigated these things all the time, I guarantee you they would have filed a motion for a stay. It seems to me they would have had a pretty good argument, but their argument was a whole lot worse once hundreds, maybe thousands of people had been married because how do you unring that bell? They missed the movement and took for granted that their worldview was the worldview of everyone within the confines of the state. And because there's so little separation between church and state in Utah, I'm sure that officials in the Attorney General's office not only believed they were right, but they just believed everyone else would think they were right. So we got our license, we went downstairs, Mayor Becker was there and he said, Peggy, can I perform the marriage ceremony? I said, sure. So Mayor Becker said to Marcelino, how do you feel about this after he would performed the ceremony? And he goes, wow, wow, wow. 
my mom's been finally married. <laughs> so. The national media descends on the state of Utah, and what do they see? <laughs> but hundreds of loving couples getting married. All their lives. No, you're not good enough. You cannot have this. You're second class. There they were getting married. There was like this, it was like an assembly line. <laughs> and then I looked around and I realized, you know, all this time we'd been saying something about kids. A friend of mine came up and she says, do you know how many kids are going to wake up in the morning and their parents are married and their families are going to be equal? Back in the corner there were these two women later found out they'd been together for 18 years and they were both standing there holding their marriage license just reading it line by line and crying and then you have the angry villagers with their pitchforks and torches down in happy valley screaming and ranting and raving these are people who are tied to the lds church these are supposed to be christians these are supposed to be religious people and all they're down there is hate full of hate and anger and rage, trying to figure out how they're going to fight people who are in love. These organizations claim to be pro-family. They're not. They're the worst that you can be for families. They're only pro their families as they define them. Gail Ruzica of the Utah Eagle Forum lobbied heavily in favor of Amendment 3 and says she and others will continue to fight for traditional marriage. Marriage is a state issue. It is not a federal issue. So a federal judge does not have the right to tell Utah what we're going to do with our, our marriage laws. BYU law professor Lynn Wardle has published extensively for years his arguments against same-sex marriage. What is the effect of those marriages? Uh, that's a very tough legal question. Governor Gary Herbert issued this statement. The state is requesting an emergency stay on this ruling pending the appeal. This is a significant decision, first in history. We will defend the law that's on the books, which we do recognize as the will of the people. I was a supporter of Amendment 3 as an individual. Uh, I think that's the best way to have family arrangements and the best chance for children, husband and wife, father and mother. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reacting to the ruling in a statement. The church says, quote, we continue to believe that voters in Utah did the right thing by providing clear direction in the state constitution that marriage should be between a man and a woman, and we're hopeful that this view will be validated by a higher court. News specialist Sandra Ease live in Salt Lake City tonight with our top story. Sandra, how many counties are refusing to issue licenses? Well, Dave and Deanie, we called every clerk's office in the state and five do not have plans to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. News at 9. Thank you for joining us. It was billed by organizers as a call for an uprising after a federal court decision voided Utah law against gay marriage. The event is in Utah County. Fox 13's Todd Tanner is live in Highland. Hi, Todd. The event was organized by the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. Organizers and speakers here say that basically Gov Governor Herbert has failed at his job and it will be up to law enforcement and everyday citizens to deny gay marriage. We need people to stand up and speak out. We need to get noisy. We need some outrage. The way you take back freedom in America is one county at a time. The sheriffs need to defend the county clerks in saying no, we're not going to issue marriage licenses to homosexuals. I want to say this to the homosexual community. We mean you no harm. First, we ask you that you understand the history of America and that the intention of the Founding Fathers in developing a constitution that does one thing, protect God-given innate rights. And these people fought and died for this, and now we're going, oh, well, you know, well rights are whatever we say they are now. You're never going to convince us that homosexual marriage is one of those innate God-given rights. It's not. It's not. It's not one of those rights. And we don't want any more of your gay appreciation parades. And we don't want any more of this that we're going to teach this in the schools without our permission and without us being involved. 
We have rights. And we choose not to teach that to our children, and we don't want you teaching it to them either. tonight the amazing brain behind all this that the glue that stuck this all together for everybody Mark Lawrence <laughs> Judge Shelby has a new title he is an activist judge yes. <laughs> so I said I thought what is an activist judge apparently an activist judge is a judge who understands the Constitution of the United States <laughs> Same-sex marriages in Utah are now on hold. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court granted the state a stay, which means gay couples in Utah will no longer receive marriage licenses. But what about couples that are already married? In a press conference responding to the ruling, new Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes says he doesn't know if marriages between Utah's same-sex couples will remain valid. This is precisely the uncertainty we were hoping to avoid legal documents filed to the U.S. Supreme Court, where Utah made its case for a stay. The state went on to discuss the possibility of same-sex marriages being retroactively voided. Right now is a rough time for gay couples who want to adopt a child in the state of Utah. Although some couples may have completed the adoption process, the state wants to put those adoptions on hold. The state of Utah says its constitutional authority to define marriage should stay intact. That is according to a legal brief filed with the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals late last night. Tonight, political specialist Richard Pyatt says the waiting game begins even as emotions simmer over this issue. State attorneys insist society can only have one understanding of marriage as a one-man, one-woman institution, the best for raising children. Redefining marriage, the brief reads, as a genderless, adult-centric institution would fundamentally change Utah's child-centered meaning and purpose of marriage. Instead, the state says, the laws at issue here simply encourage a familial structure that has served society for thousands of years. At the legislature, leadership in the Utah Senate quietly cheered this brief on the basis of state and religious freedom. We feel it's a duty to defend our jurisdiction over the definition of marriage. They really recognize the issues of religious freedom. They, is they recognize the issues of how do we raise children. The case now goes before a federal appeals court in Denver, but many expect it to find its way to the Supreme Court. A Supreme Court decision could have major repercussions across the country. If Utah's ban is overturned, the same could happen for same-sex marriage bans in nearly 30 other states. The way things kept falling into place for this case, I just got to a point where it became so euphoric for a while, we didn't think anything could go wrong. And I was really, really convinced that this was going to work because we were a small, independent team working together just for Utah. But I was getting guff from national organizations going, you shouldn't be doing this. This is too big for you. I just said, you know, fuck you. <laughs> what are you doing? The pushback was phone calls telling us that you are a little law firm in the backwater of the nation. Everybody believed we would never get it done here. We're too red. It's too conservative. It's the home of the LDS Church. Sixty plus percent had passed Amendment 3. People were very unhappy with us. I mean pissed. A case from Utah was not on anybody's agenda. It's not because, oh, 
you can't have glory, it needs to be done our way, like we need the glory. A lot of these large national organizations are what I call the professional homosexuals, people who make six-digit incomes on exploiting being gay. They all had these roadmaps all lined up. They were going to win marriage equality because they have to justify their six-digit incomes and to their donors. When you go full steam ahead with the righteousness of your convictions and you think you've got it nailed and you think you know exactly what you're doing and then you lose. In the cases we're involved in, you don't just lose for your client. You lose for the whole effing community. I uniformly got shut down by every one of the experts telling me that they were not willing to help me because I was not affiliated with a national organization. So they just refused to help us. And Mark was angry. He's not a person who wanted to be part of an organization telling him what to do. But at the end of the day, all of the organizations, we're all on the same team. And you need to learn to play together and use each other's strengths to get what you all need. Peggy then reached out to NCLR and said, I know NCLR understands these issues. And so, you know, we started helping out and then came in formally. A couple of days later, I got a phone call from an investor who had just sent us a check for $1,000. And he says, well, you better send me my check back. And I said, what? What are you talking about? He says, well, you guys have been going on and on about this grassroots organization, this little law firm, and you've turned it over to a national organization. I went onto the NCLR website, and there is Derek and Moody, see our plaintiffs, our new law, our new case in Utah. We were told that they would be representing the plaintiffs. That started making me angry because as far as I'm concerned, they have no right. They have no justification coming here telling us anything because none of these organizations have done anything for us. All of a sudden, we were not included in meetings anymore. We were not included in any communications anymore. We had a really good thing going. And that good thing was driven apart by a national organization. And then things started getting even worse. And it finally got to the point where it was, all right, Mark, shut the fuck up and get under the bus. It was incredibly disappointing. It's like being at the highest point in your whole life and then being at the lowest point in your whole life. Just, it's like crashing. Our primary purpose in this case was to raise the money. And I've never done fundraising before. I just thought it was gonna be easy. And that turned out to be a big disaster. <laughs> did not happen. I'm not a professional homosexual, I'm an amateur homosexual. <laughs> you work and you sweat and we kept thinking it'll take off any minute now. And then we would have a fundraiser with 10 or 20 people at it. People don't like giving money to lawyers and that's always gonna be that way. People were appalled that they were charging us and not doing this pro bono. One of the things that's been said is that we were greedy. That, that we wanted to make money off of this case. And I will admit that we wanted to be paid, and that was a fundamental premise of what Mark Lawrence told us when he came in the door. At the end of the day, I think we are about $900,000 in unpaid attorney fees. One of the other things that really became an issue for us was that they were lying about how much money we had paid. There were even rumors that we were financially disreputable. I think one of the other plaintiffs said she had heard we had raised $200,000 and only 5000 of it had gone to the lawyers. And I thought, oh my goodness, we'd be lucky if we donated 5000 to the lawyers. <laughs> and what about 200000 Wow! <laughs> there was no way we had ever raised that much. A call for civility on social media from the man at the heart of Utah's same-sex marriage case. That call came, appropriately enough, on Facebook. The author of the post is one of the plaintiffs directly involved in the same-sex marriage case. I think it's important for, for us as a community to, to be respectful. So when you direct a negative comment towards Governor Herbert saying, look at us, we're a family, we are normal just like everybody else, and then some bad words, that's going to nullify the message that you're trying to send to him. Governor Herbert, you are pandering to a small group of radical fanatics. <laughs> 
You are harming our families. You are harming the families who don't meet your tiny, narrow, naive definition of what a family is. Well, guess what, Gary? There's a lot more of us. And the hell with political correctness. <laughs> We started getting a lot of criticism about what we were doing, and that became an issue. The plaintiffs started becoming very volatile. They were like little vials of nitroglycerin. They had to be handled very carefully. And things continued to break down. We were called into a meeting at one of the plaintiffs' house. We sat with all the plaintiffs and the legal team, and they proceeded to attack us. Mark is irrational, he's going to have a burst of flames, but it's going to die out very quickly. We are used to Moody's little fucking shit fits and temper tantrums, and every time he does this, everybody bends, over, bends him over and kisses his ass. It's like, oh God, Moody's mad, oh no, everybody drop what you're doing, Moody's pissed. And Mark has definitely laid the foundation for all of us, and we need to be very appreciative. You know what? He had a vision, and I want to grant him that. But he cannot go on embarrassing us. But a lot of it is just miscommunication. No, it's hey, not. No, 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 that's not miscommunication. Moody is spouting his shit because he's frustrated. He did not like the way I speak in my public speaking. That is a weakness for me, and it's something I'm very, I hate it. I fucking hate public speaking. I think that's the problem with Mark, is he takes an all or nothing approach. I feel like we've been attacked. He had the warrior mentality, and it wasn't the right time. Mark harbored pretty hard feelings about how he'd been treated. But from our perspective, we really needed to make sure we weren't doing any kind of damage that could hurt the case. And so I think that's really where we began to part ways. I called a lawyer, and I said, I want you to dissolve our relationship with McElby and Greenwood. We want nothing to do with these people again. Utah will spend $300,000 to bring in a team of three outside attorneys to help defend the state's same-sex marriage ban before a federal appeals court. The Utah Attorney General's office announced only a few hours ago that it has chosen Jean Scher to lead the team. Attorney General Sean Reyes says Scher has handled dozens of cases before federal appeals courts. There really is a conflict between same-sex marriage or institutionalized same-sex marriage and religious liberty. So Utah hires Washington, D.C. attorney Gene Shear to help them defend the same-sex marriage ban in front of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver. Shear is a Mormon, and as he's leaving his firm, he crafts this email in which he's explaining to his colleagues his reason for going to do this. He feels a religious duty to help defend traditional marriage. Gene Scher came into the Senate Republican Caucus and said that we were forbidden to run any legislation that might touch on the LGBT community. And for the Utah legislature to shut its doors, we're better than that. We take on the tough issues. Remember, he was working for the state and talking about working for a conservative think tank. So I think it was a very cheap move, and that's what I said in that caucus, that I didn't feel he was representing the state. I felt like he was representing this conservative think tank. There was such a desire for people to understand the diversity of gay rights, yet it didn't seem to flow both ways. Any community has a strong majority of something. Now, there are a lot of people who follow the LDS faith in the legislature, and Attorney General Reyes happened to be a Mormon bishop years ago, but I did not see the LDS church ever coming in and lobbying us during the case. I'll just throw that out there. They didn't. There's no doubt. I mean, absolutely. Anything that happened on the same-sex marriage issue, the church was controlling. 
I mean, remember, I've, I've dealt with the church on LGBT issues. Whether it's a whisper and a nod here and there, the church completely was in favor of what was going on. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been happening. A system is in place, and it's a good thing a system is in place, and we'll continue to do our jobs. We have finally had an opportunity to put in writing why the state's opening brief wholly lacks merit. And I think the thing that is disturbing to me is this whole child-centric argument when they're now intervening in all of these adoptions. If they cared about the kids, they would care about providing as much security, stability, and support as they can. I just want to know it's really gone and it's in someone else's hands and that they're going to be reading it after reading the state's brief and they're going to go, yeah, that's what we were thinking and they said it better. If you read the state's brief, it is really an emotional plea based on arguments that are not real or supported by social science and ignore constitutional tenets. The Constitution is intended to avoid having any majority impose its personal biased viewpoint on the rest of the citizens. I think we're just going to have to file the one they sent us. We don't have enough time. Hey, and oh, this is perfect. We're good. Sorry, buddy. Go to bed. We are so excited about this. The brief is awesome, awesome, awesome. We're almost there. As long as we get it filed before midnight, that's what matters. Next week, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals will hear Utah's case against same-sex marriage. Now, this is a ruling that could impact every single state in this country. It'll likely be the first federal ruling on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage ever. And we are not going away. This is our home. Utah is exactly the right place. We have always experimented with social marital relationships in our whole history. We are blessed when we are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Whatever any court decides does not end this fight. The court does not decide the definition of marriage. Now, at least 84 people or groups are filing themselves as friends of the court. Religious groups like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And just yesterday, a group of 81 state lawmakers filed saying, quote, we especially feel a profound duty to the children of the state. The impact of a bad ruling will be felt for decades. Okay, turn around. Okay, well, as long as it's not a full choke, you're fine.
very handsome today. Thank you, Your Honors, and good morning. I'm Gene Scher, uh, and I'm honored to appear today on behalf of the state of Utah and its people. The issue is really one of authority, that is, whether under the federal constitution, the state's definitional authority over marriage allows them to retain the traditional man-woman definition of marriage. The man-woman marriage conveys the message that a mom and dad are important, okay? And when you redefine marriage, you dilute that message in the law. Your Honor, one large national study found that boys raised outside of intact marriages were two to three times more likely to commit a crime leading to imprisonment. There is no study that in fact measures that same-sex parenting is not as good as what they call man-woman marriage. We want to be clear, this historical practice is the one that Utah supports, period. forward to a swift decision and have confidence that these judges will give this case the serious consideration it deserves. And we look forward to bringing marriage equality to Utah and the rest of the Tenth Circuit. When Jean Schur argued, I was surprised that he was less of a legal advocate than I thought he would be and more an advocate for his own personal religious beliefs. It was almost to the point of being offensive how he was casting children who grew up without fathers. The fact that they were more likely to be sexual deviants and drug addicts it made me realize how much some of these positions that the state was taking were truly hurting children when my son, who was there, came up to me. He said, do you realize he's talking about me? Attorney General Sean Reyes joins me now to tell us a little bit more about how you thought the proceedings went and the importance of this case to the state of Utah. Thanks, Rich. I thought that both sides acquitted themselves very well. There were, it was a very active panel. 
uh, questions that... Uh... As we walked into the courtroom, you could feel the gravity of the moment. So we sat down on the bench and we were waiting for our oral arguments to begin and Attorney General Reyes came up and introduced himself and then he kneeled down and he said he wanted us to be happy and that he never wanted to hurt us. I, I did use the phrase, it's not personal. Obviously it's very personal to everybody, but I was saying that enforcement of the law was not intended to single out any particular family. I've tried to put myself in their shoes. And I realized he was blatantly lying because if he did care about us and he cared about our happiness, then he wouldn't be in the courtroom actively trying to prevent us from marrying one another. When he knelt down and said, I hope you know that this isn't personal, it brought tears to our eyes because it, what else was it? it, it that's all it was was personal. The position that we're taking likely causes them uh, pain and, and, uh, and heartache and, and you know I, I'm sorry for that. Um, I, I don't apologize for what we're doing in terms of representing the laws of the state of Utah by any means. I remember him saying, I know you love your family as much as I love mine. I would like to focus on the fact that he recognized that Laurie and I were a family. Same-sex marriage is once again legal in the state of Utah. And that's because of the ruling coming down about an hour ago on Amendment 3 from the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Attorney General sent this letter to all county clerks in the state. Effective immediately, all counties are advised to conduct business today and going forward, recognizing all legally performed same-sex marriages. Shelby's ruling parted the waters, and every other ruling was following in Shelby's footsteps. And the reason Judge Shelby's decision became the domino is it was the first federal court to declare that a state could not ban marriage equality. Utah to be the first domino it was unexpected. That really shocked the entire state. At that point, we knew the world had changed. When it really sank in is when I got to do my second parent adoption. I was a mess. I cried. I couldn't get my voice to quit wavering all over the place. And when you love a child, it's a very powerless position not to be able to protect them and tell them they're secure and they don't need to worry. The judge asked him, what do you think about this? He goes, I am so happy. He said, I love Peggy so much. Do you want her to be your mom? Especially I want her to be my mom. So here is my life, sitting in here getting all dirty and ruined. I haven't had a positive amount in my checking account for probably nine months now. Christ, I'm 57 years old and I don't have my own home yet. And that really, really makes me feel shitty. And I think that also has a lot to do with why I got involved in this damn case. <laughs> it's been a good distraction. <laughs> 
when you look at these stories of how sweet everything was, bullshit. We were almost at one point like a little family, and now we're enemies. Somebody asked me, would you do it over again? I don't think I would. <laughs>